بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وسبحان الله العلي العظيم ونصلي ونسلم ونبارك على محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن اتبعه بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم يا رب العالمين إنا ندعوك إنا ندعوك بدعاء نبينا آدم عليه السلام ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا وإن لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكونن من الخاسرين وندعوك بدعاء نبيك نوح عليه السلام رب اغفر لي ولوالدي ولمن دخل بيتي مؤمنا وللمؤمنين والمؤمنات ولا تزد الظالمين إلا تبارا وندعوك ربي بدعاء نبيك إبراهيم عليه السلام رب اجعلني مقيم الصلاة ومن ذريتي ربنا وتقبل دعاء وبدعاء نبيك يوسف عليه السلام فاطر السماوات والأرض أنت ولي في الدنيا والآخرة توفني مسلما والحقني بالصالحين وندعوك بدعاء نبيك موسى عليه السلام رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي وندعوك بدعاء نبيك سليمان عليه السلام رب وزعني أن أشكر نعمتك التي أنعمت علي وعلى والدي وأن أعمل صالحا ترضاه وادخلني برحمتك في عبادك الصالحين آمين يا رب العالمين عليهم السلام وأفضل التسليم إلى يوم الدين We are incredibly, as it is, approaching already the last week of Ramadan. A Ramadan that really, because of how exceptional it is, serves as an amazing remi- reminder that all the hubris of the modern world is not justified. That the entire world, with all its pretenses of autonomy and independence and strength, is such a fragile thing because the entire edifice of the modern world is built upon the mythology of human will, the mythology of powerful people. In many ways, a lie, a lie that is as big as a fallacy of the idols in Mecca. In the modern world we have our own idols and our own idols fit our age. They're not made up of stones but they are 
embedded icons nevertheless. And the idols of the modern world, like the idols of the past, are all premised on privilege and power and money. And this Ramadan, for those who reflect on it, revealed so much and had so much to teach. Whether it is jobs that feed into our pride and our arrogance, we discover that these jobs are fragile and can easily go away. Whether it is schools that we attend and the entire universe of these schools that make us feel that God or religion is something that is marginal to our existence, well, we discover this Ramadan that even these schools are very fragile. It is an entire edifice built upon a mythology of human egos. One more week, only one week left in this Ramadan. A Ramadan that also in most places there were no Taraweeh prayers in mosques. The usual social activity that people rely on to boost their sense of community and also their egos and their sense of pride have all been missing. Ramadan that you are forced to be alone if you wanted to actually focus on that with God subhanahu wa ta'ala. In short, it's a Ramadan that is a reminder of stark, uncompromising truth. The truth that the Quran itself reminds us of repeatedly. The temporality of human life, the fragility of human existence, the dependence of human existence on the higher powers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the fact that so much of our hostilities and animosities are child's play and nonsense because in an instant they can all be made subsidiary and secondary Anyone that has gone through this Ramadan and has not thought about whether they will in fact be living till the next Ramadan comes is sadly deluded. Although people are opening up and but the fact of the matter is with all the opening up all over the world, then return to re business as regular, the deadly disease still exists and it threatens all of us and no one is guaranteed that they will be still alive by the when the next Ramadan comes around. A wise person reflects upon why Allah wanted us to experience this Ramadan 
and wanted the entire world to experience this Ramadan the way that the entire world experienced it. We miss yet another opportunity to be on the right path when we experience something like this plague and we fail to think seriously about the redistribution of power and the redistribution of wealth in our world. It is a world where the rich can very quickly discover that their wealth is not as stable and embedded as they hope to be or as they thought it to be. And a world and a Ramadan at a time where the inequities of this, of this world are stripped bare, bare and we are forced to confront these equities right in the face. And it's not over because all over the world, governments all over the world have simply decided to let this plague run its course. In other words, try to save as much of the economy as they can possibly save by turning the power switch on production and economy and simply take the risk that the average and common human being will catch this disease and perish or get very ill at least until we discover some form of medical response to it. It forces us to reflect and to think very seriously about the world we live in. We all will be confronted as the world opens up around us will be confronted with that critical issue of who makes decisions on our society, in each of our societies, and what are our priorities in life? What comes first? What comes second? And whether truly human life is the foundation for our civilizational existence. Whether truly we are committed to a vision of human rights, whether we really care about the rights of human beings, or is it a rhetorical discourse that allays and soothes the guilt of rich people, but in fact is a discourse that is not substantive and not real. When we confront moments like this, it is critical that we look back at what the maker tells us in that we find comfort, we turn towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I started this khutbah by reciting the dua of a number of prophets from Adam to Yusuf to Musa to Ibrahim, the way that they all spoke to Allah, acknowledging their dependence on Allah, all these prophets, 
the way they speak to God is practically indistinguishable from the way our the Prophet Muhammad speaks to God. But second, you notice in the way all the prophets speak to the Lord is an acknowledgement that this world is not our own. And that without having an intimate relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, an intimate relationship in which we don't take the role Lord for granted, it's very easy to make God subservient to us. If we say God loves us, and loves us the way we are, however we are, as a lot of Christians do. God, take me as I am, and God just loves me. We rob God of a real will. So it becomes a paper mache God. It becomes a symbolic God. Very much like the story in the Old Testament when Jacob wrestles with God and pins God to the ground. It's in Genesis. And orders God to bless him and says, bless me. And God says, no, I'm not going to bless you. And Jacob says, well, I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me. And supposedly they wrestle for days and eventually God gives in and blesses him. For Muslims, of course, that's precisely the problem. That's precisely the problem. If your relationship with God is that God, it for all practical purposes, exists to clean up your mess, to wipe after you, to clean after you, to love you unconditionally. God doesn't interact in a viable and lively ways, does it affect your morality and teach you what is inequitable and unfair and unjust about your society? If this God doesn't teach you about the rights of others as well as your own right, if this God doesn't animate your heart with compassion and mercy and love, if this God doesn't give a sense of meaning and purpose for your existence, but most of all, if this God is not a just God, and a just God challenges the arrogant and powerful, if this God becomes something like a paper mache, something like an illusion, then it, this God shares nothing with Islam. It's a false God. It's a God of the, the ego. It's a God of a form of idol worshipping where human beings invent a God that only boosts their own egos, and their own need for validation. Every prophet, alayhum wassalam, from Adam to Muhammad, alayhum wassalam, ajma'in, the core of their message was to take God seriously. The core of their message is you're never going to figure out why you were created. You will never going to figure out why you existed. 
But if you develop the iman, the belief, if you acknowledge and recognize that there is a maker and that the causes and justifications are um, are anchored or embedded in the recognition of that maker, in the will of the maker, if you acknowledge that there is that maker and that it is the will of the maker that justifies your existence, maybe you will never get a philosophical response as to why you exist. But if you develop a relationship with the maker, you will get a spiritual response as to why you exist. The only way you can get a response is for God effectively to speak to you. And when God speaks to you, the way that the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about the Lord and with the Lord will make perfect sense to you. All the prophets come to remind you that existence, existence is alienating and scary without God. First, you're a child with a lot of questions. And as you grow older, these questions don't necessarily get answered. But what happens as you grow older is that either your sense, your awareness that these questions do not have answers become more exasperated, more acute. And because you don't have responses, you become addicted to distraction and delusion. So you indulge, you, in, you worship, because you've never got responses to the big questions. You worship money, you worship power, you worship family, you worship whatever other idols that, and distractions that exist in the world. Or alternatively, as you get older, you discover that magnanimous, majestic relationship with the divine. And then you realize that the responses to the big questions of existence, the nature of questions like, why do I exist? What is the nature of consciousness? What questions like, why does evil exist? Why is there so much injustice in the world? Regardless of the philosophical response to them, you as a believer get a response from your, the, your relationship to Allah. In other words, these very big questions are answered at the most personal and intimate level through your relationship with Allah. This is why Ramadan is so critical. It is an opportunity for us that comes around once every year for us to either develop a relationship with the divine where we forego our idols, forego our egos, forego the remarkable delusions that we weave around us 
to shelter us from our own insecurities, either we do that or we simply continue in our state of lahu, child play, until death comes around or until another Ramadan comes around. But this Ramadan was special because God sent numerous messages to humanity and the message, messages that we could have reflected on and we could have grasped and they could have truly been life-changing messages, not just for individuals, but for humanity at large. The second thing that all the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teach is while they deconstruct egoism, the vanity of egos, while they challenge the vanity of egos, they teach that with God, with God, the dignity of human beings is a sacred thing. Every prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appealed to the most dispossessed in society, the most powerless, and think about it, wasn't the message of every prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to every powerless and weak person in society is that with God you are equal to the most powerful and the most rich person in the world? Can anyone deny that? Didn't every prophet come and say to the slaves, to the poorest person in the world, to those who are lepers in the leper colonies, to basically, wasn't their message is that in God's eyes, you are equal. There's nothing about the king or the nobility or the priestly class that makes them superior to you. And in fact, in God's eyes, you could be superior to them. Isn't this what in our modern discourses we call humanism? Isn't this the philosophy of humanism? Every prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, alayhi salatu wasalam ajma'in, came and said no to the vanity of egos but yes to human dignity and human pride. Every Ramadan that comes along and it doesn't cause you to re-examine and rethink your relationship with whatever feeds your delusions of grandeur. So if you have an important job, if you're a medical doctor who specializes in something that, in the, in the US here especially, if you're a medical doctor who specializes in a field in which there aren't that many specialists, and so as a result, you charge tons of money for every visit, every time you speak to a patient, that's hundreds of dollars, if not thousands of dollars. If you're, and as, as the case is, in, with so many professionals, you go and you visit a big time lawyer who charges tons of money for each hour, and you find them fundamentally arrogant. 
the, the money has made them speak with an air of superiority. Same thing for doctors. The minute they are specialized enough and money starts rolling in, again, come, with that comes the arrogance, the vanity. What Ramadan is, and especially this Ramadan, it's as if Allah has picked it, is a reminder of the message of every prophet that Allah has sent to us. Your vanities are ugly. Your delusions are laughable. Your arrogance is condemnable. And human dignity is one and the same for all. And the fact of the matter is, even if you're not equal on this earth, because you manage to avoid being equal, in the hereafter, you will confront the reality of your equality. And those who acted with arrogance and disdain towards others will pay for it. The heart and core. The heart and core of every speech and every message that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to humanity. Time and time and time and time again. The only question is, when do we listen? So many, just so happens, that I actually know people who started out this journey, some even started Ramadan, basically remarkably confident that they're not going to get the corona disease. I know several they all happen to be Muslim, who started out with this attitude of laughing at the contagion and saying it's all exaggerated and so on, and three of them are now dead. They caught the virus and died. I wonder, how are they handling these issues, these core issues with God now when time has run up. One of them, as he was on his deathbed, was posting on Facebook these panicked, fervent prayers to Allah to forgive him and asking everyone that knows him to pray for forgiveness. I, I don't know what his, he did in his life, but I know enough to know that he was wealthy and he had a very good job and he was making very good money. And time ran up, ran out. That simple. He started out Ramadan standing on his own feet, by, that was about 40 days ago, he passed away. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa subhanallah al-Aliya al-Azim, wa salatu wa salam ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi. ومن اتبعه بإحسان إلى يوم الدين The core of what the Islamic message and every message that came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was to build up the human being in, this, in fulfillment of this magnanimous principle that sadly we have lost sight of 
Islam takes human beings from ibadat al-ibad ila ibadat rabb al-ibad. Islam transforms human beings from worshipping fellow human beings to worshipping the God of human beings. That's a literal translation. The core of, when I say Islam, I am talking about the Islam, Islam from the time of the Prophet Ibrahim a.s. who called us Muslims. So the Islam of Jesus, the Islam of Moses, the Islam of Joseph, the Islam of all the prophets, including the Prophet Muhammad a.s. This liberating, empowering message The message that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if it doesn't make you feel that, if it doesn't make you feel a sense of fulfillment, a sense of happiness, a sense of pride, good type of pride, that you are always in Allah's eyes, you're never outside the gaze of God. That your existence from the time you wake up till the time you sleep is in the company of God. That your equality with other human beings, it doesn't matter what your race is, it doesn't matter what your gender is, it doesn't matter what your wealth is. It is God that says, it doesn't matter what your educational degree is. It doesn't matter what, not, nothing matters. It is God that says that all of you are equal to one another. If that doesn't give you an emotional boost, then we, there is something deficient and missing in your understanding of Islam. I've said this before, but I will say it again and again. The core of Islam is not to pray and to fast and to give sadaqah and to go to hajj. These are rituals that we do in fulfillment of the divine command. But the core of Islam is a spirit. It's a liberated, empowered spirit. That's the spirit that brings you tranquility and peace and makes you a painstakingly ethical human being everywhere you go. I often go back again and again to the people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to support the Islamic message, message in its early stages. And I'm often just bewildered. How could it be that so Ramadans have come and gone and our local Islamic centers and our mosques and so on have missed an enormous opportunity to educate our children and us about the spirit. So, for instance, there are so many, but I'll, I'll just give you a few, a, a few examples. Take someone like Zayd ibn al-Haritha. Zayd was the Prophet's adopted 
son. Zayd ibn al-Haritha was a child in tribal Arabia in one of the tribal wars he was captured and sold into slavery. He's become a slave. He was bought by someone in... Um, uh, there are different stories as to exactly where he was bought, but anyway. He was bought by someone and eventually he ends up in the hands of Khadija's brother. Khadija, the Prophet's first wife, her brother ends up buying the slave. And he gives the slave, Zayd ibn Haritha, to Khadija. Khadija marries the Prophet, والسلام, and before she passes away, she gives Zayd ibn al-Haritha to the Prophet ﷺ as a gift. So this is a slave boy, started out a free man, became a slave, ends up in the hands of the Prophet ﷺ. Now, Zayd ibn al-Haritha For all those who, who just are carelessly throw around terms like slavery and so on, is not only freed by the Prophet, والسلام, but his relationship with the Prophet became so close and so intimate that Zayd ibn al Harisa became known he, he, by a title. Hibbu Rasulillah, the Prophet's love, or the beloved of the Prophet. Eventually, Zayd ibn al Harisa's family hears, they, they, they were looking for their child, who is like the practices of, of people around the world at the time, kidnapping children and selling them into slavery was very common. Unfortunately, that still goes on in human trafficking today. But anyway, that's a different matter. So finally, there, his family, Zaid's family, find out where he is. They find out that he's in Mecca. So they travel, they go to Mecca, they ask who, where's Zaid living? They told him he's now with this man called Muhammad. So they go to the Prophet Zaid's father and Zaid's uncle go to the Prophet and say, we will pay you any amount you want, but please return our sons to our son Zayd to us. The Prophet says, I don't want your money. There's nothing I can do with your money. But the ethical thing to do is I will call Zaid and I'll give him a choice. If he wants, he can go home with you right now. If he wants to continue living with me, that's fine. He took money out of it. He calls Zaid and Zaid recognizes his father, recognizes uncle, he hugs him, they cry, they kiss, they missed each other enormously. And Zaid's father says, here we are, we finally found you, your mother misses you enormously, come home with us. Zaid says, my life with this man Muhammad, what I saw, has made me fall in love with him so much that there is no way I can come back home with you. His father says, but you will always have the status of a former slave. Zaid's response, in Islam, that doesn't matter. Zaid, 
through the chooses the prophet, refuses to go back with his, for those people again who talk about slavery, slavery, refuses to go back with his family. But through Islam, the former slave Zaid is not only known becomes known as the love of the Prophet, Hibbu Rasulillah, the beloved of the Prophet, but is appointed repeatedly as the commander and the, the, the governor. In other words, appointed in enormously important positions. Marries a free woman from the most prestigious tribes. Islam came to underscore that there is no difference between a slave or a former slave or a free man, a poor man, or a rich man, that's human dignity. There is this story as close that Zayd and the Prophet were inseparable. Zayd eventually dies in a battle, Ma'arakat Mu'tah. And when Zayd is killed in this battle, it breaks the Prophet's heart that he sobs. And when his companions, the Prophet's companions, see him sobbing, and they say, what is this Prophet? Why you, how could you sob this way? And the Prophet, again, Islam doesn't rob people of humanity. The Prophet ﷺ said, Shawq al-Habib ila al-Habib. This is the passion of the beloved to the loved. In other words, we, we love each other. And this is human passion. No pietistic affectations, no theatrical performance of piety, but it's only Islam and the relationship with Allah can transform a human being from the most abusive situations in life and make these situations flower into something beautiful, full of dignity and humanity. I spoke about the example of Bilal. One thing I didn't tell you, that Bilal, who was also a former slave, as we said, and was Abyssinian, although Bilal was purchased and freed by Abu Bakr, and Abu Bakr made it his business, he spent nearly, he spent most of his wealth Buying and freeing slaves for those people, again, who say, ah, slavery, there's no moral problem. I I idiocy. Abu Bakr spent most of his wealth freeing slaves. One of those, as we know, is Bilal. We've talked about Bilal. But Bilal, what it didn't tell you, Bilal as Umar ibn al-Khattab often referred to him, when he would talk about Bilal, he would say, he would refer to Abu Bakr as Sayyiduna. And to Bilal, and he would say, Sayyiduna a'taqa Sayyidina. Our Abu Bakr, an, an honorific term, Abu Bakr is, 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 our Lord, meaning uh, um, a very important person, one of our top leaders. But so is Bilal. The spirit of our relationship with Allah that transforms a former slave into one of the most honored people in society, someone who is black, from no tribal origins, doesn't have a tribe, he's a mawla. 
but rises to a status of dignity and honor that you can study the life of someone like Bilal or Zayd and see the sense of pride and honor that permeates and pervades everything they do. I'll give you maybe one more example. Out of so many possible. Take. Let's take an example of the type of morality that this relationship with Allah weaves and embeds into people. Take someone like Hosef ibn al Yaman. Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman converted, his son converted with him, became again a, a, a dignified and empowered and animated by the Islamic message. Muslims fought in the early battles that Muslims were forced to fight these were truly dire times because in the Battle of Badr, in the Battle of Uhud, in the Ghazwat uh, um, al Khandaq, and so on, all of them, Muslims were vastly outnumbered. Their opponents had weaponry that far surpassed the weaponry of Muslims. In other words, they needed for every person in their ranks to count. So, in the Battle of Badr, the very first battle, where Muslims, the, 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 the enemies have ten times as many horses as Muslims do, I don't know how many times more spears and arrows, the swords that enemies carry are much better than the swords that Muslims have. Muslims are in a truly dire situation as they wait, as they're getting prepared for this battle. Huzaifa ibn al-Yaman hears that the battle was going to break out, that the Meccans are getting ready to attack Muslims in Medina and he drops his business, he was doing some trade and he drops whatever business he's doing and he tells his son, let's rush back to Medina to help defend our fellow Muslim brothers and sisters. So they drop everything and they rush back to Medina. On the way to Medina, they're intercepted by Meccans. The Meccans tell them, where, where are you going? They say, we're going back to Medina. They say, where's your merchandise? Uh, we left it. Well, so that means you're going back to join the forces of Muhammad against us. You, you're rushing back to Medina without your merchandise because you want to Fight, do you want to join Muhammad's army? Huzaifa ibn al Yaman knows that if he says yes, they'll kill him. Him and his son. So he, he said, No, no, that we, we, we're not. We're just about going back home. Seriously, you're going back home? Yes, we're just going back home. Okay, promise us that if you go back to Medina, you're not going to join Muhammad's forces against us. Huzaifa ibn al-Yaman, if he says, no, I don't promise, again, he'll be killed. Or worse, he will be sold, him and his son will be sold into slavery. So he said, okay, yeah, I promise, we're not going to fight against you. Huzaifa ibn al-Yaman 
and his son then go, reach Medina, they enter upon the Prophet, in the Prophet's presence, they tell him the story, they say, we're here, we dropped everything, and we're here to help defend our fellow Muslims. We know that you need every person in your ranks. The Prophet says, I'm sorry, but no, you can't join us. Because you made the promise, you're going to have to keep it. And we have Allah. I often paused before the story. Look at how seriously, even at a dire time, at time of Nash of, of intense state emergencies. Principles matter. Ethics matter. Morality matters. The word of a Muslim matters. The dignity of a Muslim matters. No, since you gave them your word that you're not going to fight against them, then you're going to have to keep your word. And we have Allah. And in fact, the Muslims fought the Battle of Badr and won and Hosefa ibn Yaman and his son did not fight. There are so many, so many narratives that remind us again and again that if Islam doesn't teach you dignity, doesn't teach you fulfillment and pride and elevation in the divine nature, but at the same time teaches you humility before everything that actually matters. If it doesn't teach you equality and human dignity and the importance of justice as the yardstick by which God will judge if God told you the reason I created the life and will resurrect you is to fulfill a principle, what's that principle, God? The principle of justice. A priori that justice would become a core principle in our life. If Islam the Islam inside of us was the Islam of the Prophets السلام, and the Prophet Muhammad and the student, the Islam of the students of the Prophet Muhammad السلام, السلام, we would engage our world with a very different sense of morality and sense of ethics and a very different sense of dignity than what we see around us all over the world. Build your relationship with Allah. There is only more, one more week left. Find liberation in Allah. If Allah did not want our liberation, Allah would have never revealed the divine self. God could have created us and chose not to tell us about God's self. But God chose to tell us. And God chose to tell us to bring us comfort, to bring us tranquility, to bring us a sense of purpose, to bring us a sense of stability. This is why God revealed God's self. And God anchored in us the fundamental principles of our dignity and that God's message from beginning to end is about justice and human dignity. <laughs> يا رب اهدنا لأقرب من هذا رشدا يا علي عظيم 
Allah forgive us, forgive our sins, increase our faith, inspire in us your love and the love of everything that you love. Inspire in us dignity, purpose, beauty, and justice. Allow us to see the truth of your path and to follow that path till the day we leave this world. Thank <laughs> you.